Hans Peter, how are you doing? Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to uh, to talk with you today. Yeah, cool. Same. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Dive into all the the science of of the work we do. Um, before we do that, before I ask questions, maybe just give a quick overview for the audience about yourself, where, where you're from, the work you do. Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, Hans Peter Schmidt. Um, live in the Swiss mountains, where we founded uh, the Itaka Institute 15 years ago. Uh, we we started mainly uh, as an institute for economic research, uh, food security, biodiversity, organic farming, and then we came upon biochar. We did some of the first field trials with biochar, and and got got into biochar-based fertilization, uh, mainly for tropical countries. Um, and at this time, there was only like industrial pyrolysis to produce biochar. So, so we came up with the Contiki uh, system, which is an easy way for farmers to produce biochar on their farm, making it on their own. And uh, we did a lot of um, tests with farmers and farmer field trials, and, and it really worked very good with organic um, fertilization, combining it with cow urine and, um, and, and manure and so. And then it's it spread it spread kind of around the world the the Kentucky biochar making. Um, so it, it's not that we invented uh, the Kentucky. This is a principle that is probably around for several thousand years. Yeah. Um, but like we, we tested it with, with our scientific methods. Uh, we checked it for the emissions, for the quality. Uh, we provided the designs, how to make it so that it could spread. Um, that, that was more our task. And then, yeah, we th that is kind of part of, of our work. We, we do carbon strategies also for the industry. We work on certification. We did European Biochar Certificate uh, like 12 years ago already. And then in 2020, we created the first carbon sink certification so for negative emissions but using natural means. And... Um, yeah, and since then we 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 work now on 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 several carbon sink um, methodologies for certification. This is not only biochar; it's also enhanced weathering. It's uh, it's forestation, it's, it's urban trees, bio-based materials, and one of the things is um, is the artisan. Um, way of creating carbon sinks uh, in the farms and, and I'm super proud of this because I think that's that's a kind of game changer and I'm, I'm so happy to, um, to talk with you because you you were the pioneer that, that helped us to to develop the standard because you are on the ground and you make it happen. Cool well that's definitely what we're trying to do obviously it's uh, I can't claim to have of been here when it was designed. It was probably a little bit before my time, but not that long ago, only only kind of the last couple of years. So um, we're talking obviously about the global artisan C-Sync standard and, um, you know, working with smallholder farmers with Contiki style kilns, often soil pit methods for creating biochar. To talk from the scientific perspective, which is what I really want to kind of hone in on today, um, can you explain kind of the process of carbon removal under this standard? And, um, you know, what are the, the, the key scientific kind of principles that underpin this standard yeah so 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 what artisan and industrial biochar um making the days fr from a scientific point that there's no no difference from from let's say from from regarding climate uh because it's it's always you, you have you have these three elements uh that are essential for for biochar carbon sinks is the removal of CO2 by plants. So that's the, the, the true extraction that reduces the CO2 content in the atmosphere. But then you have the carbon in biomass. And if you leave biomass on the ground or you clean uh, with fire, yep. the biomass, then all this carbon that was removed is released again. And then it's zero. Uh, it's, it's as much as you extract it, you, you emit again. 
So here comes the technology that you use the biomass, um, you heat it uh, under the absence of oxygen to more than 400 degrees. And that is like you cook the, bio, the biomass and then you can stabilize half of the biomass carbon. So half of the biomass carbon is transformed into biochar, it's a kind of charcoal. And so, so that's the second step. So you have first the removal, second the transformation of the carbon into a stable form of carbon. Um, and the special thing about this biochar carbon is that it is resistant to biological uh, decomposition. And um, if, if you use this biochar in combination with organic fertilizers, you can, um, you can reapply it to soil where it will not be degraded. And that is the third point, that is the storage. Yep. So you store this carbon and scientific data show that at least 75% of the biochar carbon will persist for more than 1,000 years. So that is kind of geological carbon thing that you create. So, so you have these three steps, the carbon removal, the carbon transformation, and the carbon storage. And that is the same independent if it's industrial biochar making or artisanal biochar making. Cool. Can you you touched on it on it there, and and this is one of the the main questions we come we get come up from from buyers that are that are looking at biochar within the artisan standard. The work we do. Can you can you talk a little bit about durability um, in terms of uh, you know the the biochar that's produced under the standard? How can you kind of guarantee the durability and the and the the hundred versus the thousand years in terms of uh, the carbon that is sunk from it? Yeah, so with, with all predictions, um, it's tricky because um, how you know what will happen tomorrow and how you will know what happens in 10 years, uh, given what will happen in 1,000 years. Yeah, sure. So, so we do, uh, in one way, we do predictions because we can analyze um, the carbon structure of the material um and so so this is these are carbon rings they cling together and if if you uh, put it uh, or, or if you inoculate it with degrading uh, microorganism you you can check how much of the carbon will be in fact degraded so yeah. so you can see um that this inert form of carbon, which is the 75%, is not touched by microorganisms. If you inoculate it for one year, two years, three years, it will not be touched. Yeah. So, so that, that is one thing, but still that does not bring us to 100 years, uh, given to 1,000 years. So what we can do um, is we, we look to history. We, we look what, what happened on Earth. And uh, biochar, um, exists since uh, since millions of years, in fact, uh, because there is also a natural process of producing biochar. So in, in every uh, prairie fire, in every forest fire, uh, part of the biomass is transformed uh, into biochar. And uh, in, in fact, the forest fire works very similar to a contiki. Yeah. You, you starve, um, you starve the, the forest from oxygen because all the oxygen is used for the oxidation of biomass and no fresh air can come in. And then that creates the heat. So the fire is like a fire cap. And under the fire cap, you have the heat and that transforms the biomass in, into, into biochar. Now, People, uh, scientists, uh, they did the statistics. They they looked on how much or how many um, forest fire there have been in the last ten thousand years. Yep. Um, or two thousand years, three thousand years. So 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 it's it's known how much uh, biomass is turned in into. Um, into biochar, into ash, and into into gases every year. 
And then you know, uh, for let's say 2000 years, how much biochar was produced naturally within this time frame. And then you check how much of this biochar is still left. So there's a lot of biochar that's naturally in all soils. It's part of the soil organic carbon. But then um, biochar goes down to the sediments. It goes down the waterway. It's in the ocean. So if, if you analyze how much of this pyrogenic carbon, it's called, this is the, the biochar, how much is left on Earth? And, and you, you make the balance with how much was produced. The difference is what decayed or yeah. what de was uh, decomposed. And that calculations brings us um, to an estimate of uh, at least 1,500 um, to probably more than 15,000 years. So there is uncertainty on how much or how many more years than 1,500 is attained. Sure. But the, the lower edge is 1,500 years. The higher edge is um, is 15,000 years. And most probably it's, it's even much more because in the end, uh, lignite um, or coal, fossil coal that's, that's in soil, at a certain moment in time, it was biochar. Sure. And... Of course, yeah. I mean, science is all about you know continually learning and and testing. And I, I mean, there are obviously papers out there on on all of this in terms of the journey you went through uh, to understand the things you just talked about. Correct? Yes. So so there's kind of large apparatus of literature dealing with with all this. Um, but on, on the other hand, it's, it's also that um, it, the, the question of durability or persistence is overrated. Right. Why, why this is overrated? First, uh, we have to save our planet in the next 50 years. So if you continue like today, in the next 50 years, there's not so much to save anymore. So there is, is one reason that we, we may not be too much concerned about the next 1,000 years, um, especially not paying today for a service that will be rendered in 1,000 years uh, when probably other industrial uh, methods are available. But this is one thing. Uh, the other thing is um, that the old schemes of uh, carbon credits, they pretended to offset CO2 emissions mm. completely. But CO2 emissions have a global warming effect for millions of years. It will not stop in 100 years. It will not stop in 1,000 years. Emissions have um, a very, very long uh, global warming effect. And um, so you, you cannot turn the wheel back these emissions happened sure and uh so what we can do now is create global cooling uh for the time that is of concern so let's create global cooling now let's create global cooling for the next 30 40 years uh and create the framework so that next generation can also create global cooling yep uh to compensate for the effect of the emissions do, do you want to just just explain the difference because some of these terms so global when you talk about global cooling how is that something different than you know when we talk about carbon removal or, the industry i find you know which is is changing and, and evolving every day there are new terms that that come up and you know removal carbon removal is not new but certainly as terminology it's only been a few years that people and actually when you go to speak to a sustainability manager inside a corporate company that's probably they're probably 12 months into their learning and now this talk to us about global cooling what what does that mean um you know to to a, a man or a woman on the street i suppose in terms of what that means in terms of this whole space and the work we're doing yeah in fact it's it's very easy it's 
So, so the old system is you emit uh, carbon dioxide and you do a removal. So you take it back, this carbon dioxide, and you keep it removed forever. Yeah. That's the old system, but nobody can control that forever means forever. <laughs> right? So now, if you do an emission, this emission, let's say 10 tons, is the yearly emission of one person. This emission creates global warming. You can calculate this in kilowatt hours, how much global warming this is. Okay? And this is for time. You know, you create global warming for one year. You do create global warming for the second year. You create global warming for 10 years, for 100 years, for a million years. What we are concerned is the annual global warming. How much warming does this create next year? And now I can create um, global cooling, which means I extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and keep it for one year. So I have a one-year effect. Yep. And because I remove this CO2 for one year, I can calculate the global cooling effect, which is exactly the same as the global warming, yep. uh, just the other way around. So 10 tons emissions create 10 tons of global warming. Yep. 10 tons removal create 10 tons of cooling. But what is important, it's about the time. So this is for one year, yeah. and what we create as a service is a, is a temporary service. It's a service for one year, and then you have to renew it. The next year, second year, you create again cooling services. So what is the cool thing about this? <laughs> it's physically correct. You can super nice calculate it. In fact, it's cheaper because you do not have to pay for a service that's rendered in 100 years, but you only pay for the service that's created now. And um, you can really assure that the cooling that you sell is done. Yeah. No, you do not promise anything for the future, but you do something now and that's measurable and that's what you can sell. Makes sense. So, so if I, yeah, if I, if I abbreviate to to my level of, of thinking, you're talking short term, immediate effect, measurable today or this year, or so it's it's much more of a an immediacy in terms of the effect it's having and and the impact that 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 service or, or that process is then having. Yeah, you see, I can give you an example that's that's very telling. You 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 have a tree. You know, you plant a tree, it takes some time that it grows. But let's say now you have a 10-year-old tree. And you know exactly how much carbon dioxide this tree takes out of the atmosphere from year 10 to year 11. Mm. That is the cooling service. Yep. Now, you can measure at the end of the year uh, how much the tree grows was. And that's the cooling service that you can sell. Yep. And that you control and there is no cheating possible. If this tree is cut in the 12th year because someone just takes the wood or because there is a forest fire, uh, the tree is not there anymore, you cannot create a service. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because what we do in the certification scheme is we look if the tree is there, how much the tree was growing, and that creates the global um, cooling service that's registered. So in, in traditional um, CO2 certificate, or, or credits, you would certify a forest and you would say, normally this forest should be there for the next 30 years. So you get paid already for the next 30 years while the service is only annually and you are not sure if in 10 years the forest is still there. So that's the main difference. It's yeah. you create something that you can measure and that's what you bring on the market. Yeah, and I think to your last point or your 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 latter point there, I mean that's a, a been a huge issue as we all know, without us going down the the rabbit hole. But I, I think, yeah, th this kind of you know selling something that is a based on a future prediction that cannot really be measured because of the possible risks around that, as you as you as you explain, I think it's something we're rapidly getting away from and need to because it's just not uh, doesn't have enough stability in terms of a service. So yeah, makes sense. 
Uh, getting back to the the artisan standard and 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 biochar and and working with smallholder farmers and stuff we do talk talk me a, a little bit about the journey about it how it all came about obviously i know you um you know had had been working with biochar for a, a long time before that but the standard itself is you know really a couple of years old it, it's it's relatively new um but what what was the journey in terms of uh the the, the artisan standard how it came about T- talk talk me through a bit of that yeah so so as i said in the in the introduction we created the european biochar certificate already in 2011 so so yeah. you imagine you have you have a biochar plant that produces a ton of biochar per day uh you have lots of electronics around you can you can uh, have remote control you register all the temperature you measure the emissions um and uh so you can imagine that the certification of of such such a plant is 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 more kind of technology driven, you know. You measure things, you control that they are correctly measured, uh, you put them into statistics, you do analysis of of the products, um, and in the end you you get you get a pretty nice guarantee that that what you sell is uh, what's on the certificate. Yeah. The thing is, such plans, they cost several millions uh, investment. Uh, you need uh, people to run them. Uh, the cost of producing a ton of biochar in such a way is whatever 100 to uh, between 800 and 1,000 uh, US dollar per ton just the range. Now, if you imagine the tropics, you have farmers that may earn, let's say 10 euro per day with growing crops, 350 per year. They will never be able to buy a ton of biochar that costs a thousand. Yeah, they would have to work three years just for this, right? However, um, biomass grows the most in the tropics because you have the sun, you have the rain, you have the water, you have uh, you have uh, fertile soils, and it's just growing massively compared to the industrial countries that usually are on the north or in the further south. So, if you want to do something for the climate. Um, we need to use tropical plants in the tropics. But we have not the social economic system to install industrial plants mm. at the farm side. So there is a possibility, which we talked about, is the Kontiki. It's, um, it's small scale, it's, it's manual work. Um, emissions are still low. Um, and, and the quality is good, and, and the farmer can use this biochar on his own land. So, however, the farmers are small. So if you have like one hectare land on average, uh, this one hectare of land can produce in extra, let's say, five to ten tons of biomass. That brings about one to two tons of biochar that the farmer can make. Um, so that's not industrial production. Um, but if, let's say, a thousand farmers of a larger village uh, would do it, you, you have 2,000 tons of biochar produced, and that means you have about 5,000 tons of CO2 removed on the long term. And in addition, today, most of these farmers, they burn their crop waste and create a lot of pollution. This would stop because they turn it into biochar. So, so that's a situation, and it's, that's a fantastic situation. But because of the socioeconomic situation, well, you cannot certify what these farmers do. But what they do is the same thing, uh, is, is as good for the climate as an industrial company. Mm. So that was the challenge. How, how do we create a certification scheme that can include thousands of farmers, um, that are small-scale producers, um, but 
that in the network produce more biochar and more efficient than all industrial companies together. So potentially there are, there are more than 2 billion farmers that could produce one to two tons of biochar each every year. So, so that would be a significant amount of carbon removals. You know, that this, this is like more than 5 billion tons of CO2. Mm. That's the potential. So, and just because it's difficult to do a certification, we skip this 5 billion tons of CO2 removal potential. <laughs> That's our situation. So, so we're very happy to... Um, to work with with Biochar Life and um, and with Warm Heart Foundation that pushed us and said we want to have this certification by the end of the year. So without you, it would not have been by the end of the year. It was in our mind, but we needed a bit of pushing it. <laughs> and in the end, uh, we created this this artisan. Uh, carbon sink certification that works pretty well that uses technology like smartphone apps uh, to track all the production that created carbon sink managers uh, that manage uh, farmer networks of up to 1000 farmers do the training uh, do the monitoring uh, do the checkups that they only use the biomass that's produced on their land and they use the biochar in their land. Uh, also train them how to use it efficiently so that more biomass can grow. Um, check also that they stop burning crop wastes. And and altogether this is is a methodology um, that's progressing. So the first version is not the last version. So we already had two updates and, and we prepare like every year an update to, um, to account also for the experience um, on the land in the countries and it's growing exponentially. Today it is by far the hugest or let's say the biggest because it's still not huge but it's by far the biggest negative emission methodology worldwide that creates most of the carbon sinks cool all other technologies combined yeah, well i mean it of, of, you know I, li I live in a i live in an area of thailand where i'm surrounded by smallholder farmers so i can absolutely see the need for it, it we don't have enough of it here but that you know as as you talk then i mean obviously the the removal of carbon is highly important and it's part of the motivation but um the fact that many of these farmers will then not burn their fields and uh, put you know toxic smoke into the air with pm 2.5 and then of course the biochar itself being able to be used as a um, you know mixed with soil as, as a fertilizer and, and increase yield so it has so many um you know kind of multiple benefits in terms of a a a process it's great so um but maybe if, you're, if I may add so yep. something really important that, that makes work this uh, this method is those farmers that that really earn only like five to ten euro depending on the country uh, per day uh, working that day producing food for others. Mm. But this is the value. In, I mean, because they. They, they buy uh, in local currency, so it's it's difficult. You, you cannot compare the five euro in, per day in Thailand. You can you can live from it. You, you do not yeah, stop. Yeah. Okay, but it's still it's low, and uh, it's low because uh, it is it is the the local currency. Now, you produce carbon sink. You produce CO two removals, and that's a global commodity with a global price. Yeah, yeah. So what you do now is you connect the farmer to the global market. Because the farmer in Germany will get the same um, amount of money per ton 
of removed carbon as the mm. farmer in Thailand. Yeah. And that makes a big change because now farmers can earn for climate services um, on the world market price. Yeah. And, and that's a significant change. They, they, there are farmers in, in, in certain countries, they can double their income with carbon removals. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we are certainly seeing, I mean, it, it's different depending on which country you're in, but certainly in, in parts of East Africa, we're absolutely seeing a huge impact in terms of the economics around this process and people being able to send kids to school because of being part of this program. So that's a you know a completely different benefit that sits outside of the 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 environmental impact of it as well, of it as well. So yeah. And then you know, there's there's another thing. Now, warm heart. Uh, so, sorry, so your 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 background organization yeah. and some other organization that are accredited as as artisans. Uh, they're, they're non-profits. That they come from the fear of um, the sphere of uh, development aid, hmm. and and they have the farmer interest in mind. Now, um, our methodology is not restricted only to nonprofits. Yeah. So, so there are new companies. They come and organize it for profit, and take more and more of this share of the carbon sink. Even so, we write in the standards that 80% should stay with the farmer. Um, there are always ways to go around this. Hmm. And and in the end, if, if you if you add too much profit in between, um, you end up like with other global commodities, cacao or coffee, that, um, that the farmer will get less than 10% of the value of its crop. And so, so today farmers get 50 to 80% of the carbon sink value. And, um, and that's a driver for, for growth. But the market price for carbon sink removal is, is not high enough um, for, for large companies to also earn with it. So, so this is a limiting factor, mm. and it may limit also the development of it. So let, let's let's see what happens. But also, what we, we we know that from from the IPCC, there's a lot of money that should be transferred to um, to developing countries to pay for for climate services and. Um, and, and, and if the countries, the, the nation states, they're serious about it, they have a possibility here to really do climate mitigation, but but also removals. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point, there's a balance. Uh, obviously, you know, with Warm Heart, Warm Heart started out 10 years ago training farmers, actually in Thailand, not far from where I am, how to create biochar purely to stop burning. I mean, that was the motivation and it was a done on a donor model. They had to... The, the motivation for the farmer is if they were paid and and then of course the carbon markets came about and i think having a business model is a really great way to scale beyond a few hundred farmers to hundreds of thousands of farmers which is where we want to get to and like you say i think it's it's that balance between it being a a business model that enables more and more farmers to earn a living from us and us to scale rather than it yeah, becoming money elsewhere and it, and it, you know, not necessarily benefiting the farmers. So um, I have a question on that, really, I suppose, just more of, I suppose, as we close out, I mean, where, what is your, what is your vision with where this all goes? We're, you know, we're, we're in a, certainly in an interesting place right now with the world, with everything that's happening. Um, this standard is, 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 is quite young. We would love to have, you know, there's half a billion, I think, smallholder farmers. But where, where, what is your vision for the next five to ten years of of this standard, of this technology, of the things that link into it, and where you see where you see it all going? Yeah. Um, still, what, what we talked about, Kontiki, it is a bridge technology. It's, it's the carbon efficiency is is relatively low. 
and uh, so in, instead of of using only about 40 percent of the biomass carbon you could push it to 80 percent or even more uh, depending on the technology so so there will be a technology step uh, working with, with different companies to, to create uh, more sophisticated um, uh, paralyzers on village levels. Yeah. So if, instead of that everybody makes it itself, you could provide the biomass and then, then you receive your payment for it, for example. So, so there, there will be technology updates, otherwise um, the, the carbon efficiency is too low yeah. to have have a huge climate impact. On the other hand, um, it is also the way to introduce with cooling services, not only the making of biochar, but also um, the increase of biomass production. And that's a transformation towards carbon farming, so yep. that you would not just produce rice or, or sugarcane, uh, one, one crop, but that you have a more diverse farm uh, and that's, that every tree that you plant for, for an agroforestry approach is also part of the registered carbon of your farm. So, so I think we, we can use now the setup of a certification scheme on, on farmer levels to also include other forms of carbon sinks. And, um, and that, that will also be a driver to a more sustainable farming, yeah. uh, to, um, to climate adaptation, uh, to diversification of, of farmer products. And um, that, let's, that, that's my main hope that, that, uh, that farmers become uh, more um, resilient towards uh, the challenges that we know will come with climate change. Cool. Well, happy to say that I don't know if we've shared it with you, but our, our carbon village model, it almost sounded like you pitched the long-term view or vision of that model. <laughs> so it's good that that's kind of how we're, we're leading now in terms of the work we do, which is having a much more you know, longer-term view in terms of how you work with those communities beyond just the, the initial engagement around the artisan standard so um i didn't have any other questions if there was more you wanted to share please do otherwise it'd be great to share just where people can learn more about the work you do and, and get in touch if they need to or um yeah read about the science around this yeah thank you very much for the conversation it was fun it's always good to to have this opportunity to uh, to recollect the thoughts and, and also to readjust and uh, always good to explain it. I hope people like it out there. Um, you can check uh, on the itaka-institute.org website. Um, we also have the biochar journal and um, and uh, yes, um, let's let's create this this carbon removal on. Uh, on a democratic base so it's it's not only an industry approach it's a natural approach and nature um works better with farmers than with ai <laughs> indeed that's a a great uh phrase to to uh end the podcast with i will leave those links um in the podcast notes for anyone watching or listening so uh and hans peter i appreciate you taking some time out of your morning Thank you. Bye. Cool. Thanks a lot.